Thank you for this uh, invitation to come here today. It's an honor and a pleasure to give this uh, Harold Chern lecture number nine for you. And as I, as I read about Professor Cherna, I found out that he was actually one of the founders of trauma systems in uh, Germany. So what is more appropriate today than talk about trauma systems in Europe? That should be a nice connection then. I'm from the Netherlands and you probably all know the Netherlands from uh, tulips, from windmills, wooden shoes, cheese, some of the speed skating and of course Ajax. Um, <laughs> But there's more to the Netherlands. The Netherlands also has um, 17 million inhabitants on 41,000 square kilometers. And you think, okay, that's quite a space, but then do realize that 20% of those 41,000 kilometers are water. So it's quite crowded in the Netherlands, as you may have noticed if you visited there. And I work at an ancient city in uh, sort of the western part of the Netherlands, the busiest part, that's called Leiden. And it's the eldest university city that we have in the Netherlands. In 1575, Willem of Orens uh, founded the university there. And what you see there is the university building that still stands today. So that was of good quality, good construction. And we still have our professors being inaugurated there and our PhD students having to do their uh, thesis defense. So it's really an active uh, building still. The hospital that I work in looks like this. It's the LUMC, Leiden University Medical Center. And I'm very proud, of course, to let you know that in 2022, we will be the European City of Science. So you're all welcome to present there. Now, what about the kitchen of trauma surgery in the Netherlands? Something about the trauma training that we have there. Our surgical training is, uh, comprises of an education of six years. Um, and these six years are divided into four general years that you do everything. You do GI, you do vascular, you do trauma, you do some children, some pediatric surgery, and you do some transplant surgery. And then after four years, you have to choose in one of those directions. The interesting thing is that the orthopedic surgeons have a similar training. They also have four general generic years um, in which they do all kinds of orthopedic training, surgery training, and then they have to choose the last two years for a specific direction in the training. And more and more, the, uh, similar to the German and I think also the Swiss system, we get to know that um, those two last years, if people choose to be trauma surgeons or trauma orthopedic surgeons, are very similar. So we are striving towards a sort of protocol in which the trauma surgery and the orthopedic trauma surgery in the last two years of their training will be combined. And this is also seen in what we see nowadays in the hospitals in our trauma teams because we have combined the trauma surgeons and the orthopedic trauma surgeons in what we call the multidisciplinary trauma unit. Um, the inner circle is the trauma surgeons and orthopedic uh, trauma surgeons that actually deal with 80 to 90 percent of all the all the injuries and then we have spe specific expertise pathways in which orthopedic surgery but also the plastic surgery neurosurgery hpb surgery whatever you need for trauma surgeons are presented and this is something that we implemented since 2020 started to implement so it's not set in place in all uh, hospitals yet but it's coming there and it's going and it's Indeed, it's an improvement. Now, more national, we have since 1999, we have 10 trauma centers installed. They have been dedicated, they have been appointed by uh, the Minister of Health. Um, and that was actually the start of our regionalization and our, our, our forming of trauma systems in the Netherlands. The goals of these trauma centers and trauma regions was to optimize the care of the trauma for the injured patients and to optimize the organization and the quality of care through that. For that, these um, trauma centers had four tasks. They had to be expert centers, of course, in the uh, care for trauma patients, the most severely injured one, as well as the monotrauma, the simple ones. They had to set up a network of trauma care in the region and to coordinate that red network. They had to set up a knowledge center for that region, a specific region in which they had research, profound research, in which they had a good trauma database and in which they set up the uh, certification and the auditing of the, all of the hospitals, so also not the trauma centers that did trauma in their region. 
And then the fourth task was the medical, uh, the mobile medical team that was sent out pre-hospitally. That last task is in the end was um, set back to four regions. I'll, I'll show a slide just later on. At the same time, we have for all of the other um, helpers and uh, providers of care in, in tr for trauma patients pre-hospitally, we have 24 regions. It's not the same regions. So, and that's the regions of the dispatch control centers, the police, the fire brigade, and the ambulance departments. And these are the four helicopter mobile medical teams that we have in Groningen, in Nijmegen, in Amsterdam, and in Rotterdam. And they cover sort of 80 to 90% of uh, the Netherlands within a half an hour. So some more numbers, and then we'll get to the content. So we have 24 safety regions with the fire brigades, the ambulance services, etc. We have 10 trauma centers on 12 locations, four trauma helicopters, Another 70 non-level one uh, hospitals with a lot of more locations, but all of these uh, hospitals also do trauma care, not the complex, but they do. We have over 1 million trauma patients per year, of which about 80,000 are admitted, and of which again, 4,700 are poorly trauma patients as defined in ISS uh, bigger than 15 which is about 7% of all the people admitted. And again, one third of all these poly trauma patients are really ABC unstable in a way that they have a uh, revised trauma score of below 12. Now, this is a simple uh, calculation. So you have about 5,000 uh, poly trauma patients per year, 10 trauma centers. So there's enough for the expertise uh, per trauma center if you have it all centered in the centers where it had to go and that's the point that there is the catch-22 because we still are struggling to get all the polytrauma patients in the right centers and that's probably a very recognizable thing that many countries struggle with right now the average percentage of polytrauma patients that get into the level one centers is about 70 percent so there's room for improvement what about the Dutch trauma system in general? 10 centers again, we communicate and we collaborate uh, vertically. So through the chain of care on which I come in a minute, horizontally with other trauma centers in the country, of course, and with non-clinical stakeholders, also very important, such as the government, insurance companies, etc. We take care of the structured and the mandatory training that everybody has to have that is involved in trauma care. Uh, we see to the certification and auditing, like I said just now. And then, very important, there's a national trauma database that's nationally coordinated by a separate uh, organization and that takes care of um, uh, reminding you kindly but urgently if you don't fill in the, the numbers, if you don't fill in the, the patient forms. So now we're talking about trauma system. What, it took me quite a while uh, to find out what was meant with a trauma system. And if you look at it from an organizational way, then you could say that it is an organized co coordinated effort in a defined geographical area that delivers the full range of care to trauma patients, to all uh, trauma patients. And it should also be integrated in the local public health system. But if you look from what it's, what it's really about, then it addresses the injury prevention, it addresses the pre-hospital care, it addresses the hospitals that we work in, and the post-hospital care. So it's really the chain of care of what it's all about. And if you look from, uh, to it from an operational side, then it's more like an integrated structure that um, is designed to facilitate this multidisciplinary response that you all just talked about in this handover with neurosurgeons and plastic surgeons um, to deliver the full continuum of care to the trauma patients that they need um, when they are severely injured. And this, and I don't know whether you can read this, I guess you do, this is, this is the chain of care that we have implemented for our uh, trauma systems. That it, it, is, it starts with prevention, then it goes along with the bystander assistance, triage, dispatch to the accident scene, pre-hospital patient assessment, surgical procedure, the management, if necessary, transport to the hospital, intensive care, nursing care, out and inpatient rehabilitation, and in the end, the home care. For trauma surgery, 
we just reduced it to these eight steps, pre-hospital, transport, bystander alarm, trauma bay assessment, advanced diagnostics, post-operative care, nursing, dismissal, and physiotherapy. And this is what it's all about, at least in the Netherlands, and I think in Switzerland and Germany and all surrounding countries, it's very much the same. To put this system in place, it's not an easy thing. It's taken, in the Netherlands at least, it's taken um, quite some years to put it there. And you do need all of these eight elements to put a trauma system in your country. So you, have, you need leadership. You need someone who says, we're going to do it this way or that way. And for that, you need people to be trained and you need the possibility to train people. You need professional resources, the technology that supports you to put it all in place. You need, above all, finances to all um, get the things that you need and information management for the data that you uh, will have together, the research that you can do with it. And the more major part is that you have to also work on the disaster preparedness, which is a part of the trauma system, but which is not something I will talk about um, extensively today. Now, in the ideal situation, all of these eight key elements of a trauma system are integrated, coordinated, and in that way you will have a cost-efficient and appropriate service across that whole continuum of care that all of these steps that I showed you just in this chain of care. Now, the relevance of this trauma system, we looked at it from the Dutch data and it was also published, that we saw an overall mortality risk reduction of about 16% from trauma patients in general, and in 21 mortality risk reduction in polytrauma patients. So that's really something uh, if you look over the time of 10 years. If you want to have a trauma system in place in every country or almost every country, then it's good to realize that there's no such thing as a universal trauma system. Every trauma system develops along the way and along incidents that happen, along accidents that happen, along situations that will stimulate the system to go forward and to develop. Um, local needs and assessments will define those developments. So if you look at Europe, uh, we, have, we have a lot of countries in Europe. How are these countries doing, actually? And um, that's not easy to, to uh, make an inventory of. So what, what we did from Estes is um, just to set out a simple question. What is your number of trauma centers? Just to have a start somewhere. And I don't know whether it's readable. It probably is, but um, that varies from, uh, let's say, uh, 60 in Italy, 66 million in the UK, um, 11 million in um, Belgium, to um, the number of trauma centers, 30 in Italy, and uh, 121 in Germany. So if you make a ratio of that, the interesting thing is that we're all somewhere in between 1 to 2 to 1 to 1.8. Uh, 0 0.8. So there's there's not much variance in that. We all come sort of more or less to the to the same thing. But that doesn't tell everything. So what about pre-hospital care? What about trauma registries in all of these countries? What about training? What about quality control? To look into that, we did some research and we we found this paper of Ari Lapanyemi, who um, in, from Finland conducted a survey in 2008 in which he asked the European countries to rate their own trauma system, to rate their own trauma system, so there might be a bias there, um, regarding the development of established leadership, financial structure, existence of trauma centers, trauma registries, and level of pre-hospital care. And this is what they found, and that's quite interesting, because on top of it, you see, uh, each, of these, each of these parameters got at max two points, so 10 was the highest score you could get. And interestingly, the Czech Republic rated themselves as a 10 on all uh, points, which is very good, I think. And then Austria was next, and Swiss and the Netherlands, Switzerland and the Netherlands are sort of similar in their reflection on their trauma systems. But we're doing well, we're in the upper five, I think. But 
it's good to realize that there's an impressive range of results in this in this table and um, of course there's a strong potential bias of self-evaluation so we look for some more objective data and um, to find some we did a literature review and this review was published in the journal of trauma in 2017 it included actually all papers that describe national trauma systems around the world um, with the objective to give an overview of similarities and developments and um, what uh, was going on on the four points of the WHO. The background of course being that so many mortality is caused by trauma and 90% of that mortality is caused in low and middle income countries. That was something that we didn't actually realize before that it was a so high number there. And knowing that the trauma system indeed, in, the implementation of a trauma system indeed in, uh, uh, decreases mortality and uh, disability and prevents up to 30% of injury related death. The, the overall goal of course was to see whether there was possibility for change. To substantiate the numbers that I just gave you, here are um, the low middle income and upper middle income categories in the left and the green one is high income and then uh, related to the number of deaths. So it's very obvious where the majority is deceased by trouble. Now the WHO has developed an, a tool to determine the maturity of the trauma system in a country and uh, it's, it's actually quite a simple one. It's based on four parameters, pre-hospital care, facility-based care, education and training, quality assurance. It sort of resembles the points that I earlier mentioned. And they had a scoring measure for all of these four uh, points. There was a four point scale with level one on each of these being the least mature and level four being the most mature. Now, if we go through the pre-hospital facility-based education and quality assurance, this was the first one. Um, and uh, for all of the countries and all of the publications that we found, we found that Croatia, Greece, Ireland and Scotland had a level four pre-hospital trauma care, which meant that there was formal EMS present, a universal access number, coordination seen between the various providers, well-defined community, but not a control lead agency as we know here in Switzerland and also in the Netherlands, also in Germany and some of the other countries that you see mentioned here below. The facility-based trauma care, sort of the same applied, um, there, if in, in Greece and Scotland, they scored a level two because they had no 24-7 guidelines and resources available and there was no lead agency, which is necessary to be a level three facility-based trauma care country. And the majority of the European countries actually ended up in this level three column. At level four, there was a uh, clearly set mechanism for verification and accreditation of the trauma care. And, um, only Germany, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom had published about it because it's good to realize that this only resembled what was published about it in 2017 and that doesn't really mean that it's the actual truth. There might be development since then. Uh, education and training, Croatia and Greece scored a level two, um, Turkey, Finland, France, Scotland, Spain, a level three for training and education and the other countries level four. And the quality ensures similar results actually with only a couple of countries having a formal quality uh, assurance program in place. So from these results we learned that all included countries actually qualified as high income countries. I didn't, I didn't show those results because they're quite extensive but that was what we found when we measured it. And that most uh, countries have a developing trauma system in place, but no, not all of them have uh, well-defined trauma indices. Because, well, what we saw just now that they have a well-developed uh, pre-hospital care system, but 75% did not have uh, hospital verification, certification and a lead agency. And education and quality control needs further development. So just one more paper we found about trauma systems in literature uh, recently and um, that showed us that we know that a lot of trauma systems have evolved in, in, in many European countries and that they have resulted in improved care in terms of mortality and, and morbidity. But 
this paper showed that many systems have a, a similar history um, that reports of either poor services, a single disaster or um, other incidents that drove to policy changes. Mm -hmm. And this study that reports on four European trauma systems, uh, four European trauma systems looking at their background, uh, identified similar issues actually uh, in all four of the countries like standardization of protocols, concentration of skills and triage that didn't fit in uh, the way it should be. They also emphasized that uh, all of these countries did realize that measurement of outcome, patient-related outcome measures to care for of the continuous improvement of quality of care and stimulated that. So, Looking at all of these data and all of these um, findings, how are we doing? We've come a long way and progression is made. We can say that for sure, but there's also some changes that still need to be made. And if we look at what has been done, Europe has several countries with a very well-defined um, trauma system, uh, as I showed you just now. And um, most of these countries have developed a full uh, all-inclusive trauma system. and with that showed uh, reduced rates of mortality over the past decade. But not all high income countries have set up tra trauma systems, um, uh, as we also saw in the presentation. Uh, similarities are present and that's good, but uniformity is absent. We don't, although our systems are very much the same, Switzerland and the Netherlands, we don't have agreements on how we do this in Europe and how we interact with each other, how we set up our trauma system. Um, and that's something that could improve trauma care even more. And another thing, and that's a very important one, is that reliable and reproducible da data are scarce. And that's actually saying, what are we doing with our trauma uh, registries? I have no clue how your trauma registry is set up. You probably don't have no cl clue how ours is set up. And if we combine that knowledge then we could do a lot of research and even improve uh, and improve even more in the trauma care. So altogether, we're nowhere near the finish of optimal trauma care for trauma patients. Although, as I started with, we have come a long way and progression is made. So what about the future? Of course, I would like to have this EMS drone like helicopter, whatever it is, flying by itself, delivering the patients every every time it's needed. And of course, I would like to see, uh, to have the hospital rooms look like this with all the new equipment. And yes, after Corona, we would need some extra hands. And if that could be digital, then a lot of nurses would be happy, happy probably at the moment. And it would be lovely to have this for all of the residents and the training students at the OR to show them what we do and how we do it. But the re reality is different and um, the reality is that we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And although um, each country and region will probably proceed along their own line of change, depending on the circumstances, we'll need to create a European sense of political urgency and underscore uh, the importance of it, uh, that we have a new trauma system uh, that goes throughout over the borders of European countries and connects us. For that, we need to gather valid and adequate data about the current state, but also of in the future to set up these uh, proper trauma registries in all European countries. That's really a first uh, priority issue. We need, um, or we need to work at least on general guidelines that go across borders. Why should people with uh, open tibial fractures be treated here differently than it does in, in, um, in uh, other countries? Why should we treat polytrauma patients here different than we do a thousand kilometers from here in the southern part of Italy? It should be all the same and we can work on that. Um, we should strive for uniformity concerning the WHO defined criteria and that's the criteria that I showed you in the research in the publication overview. Standardized education and quality control throughout Europe, that would help a lot. It's a difficult and long way, but it would also be good for us because we can then interchange our doctors. We can work in the different hospitals and trauma care and see that it's all the same, or at least the intention is the same and quality likewise will be the same. We need collaboration in clinical trauma care, but we also need it in research and education 
The borders within Europe, in this perspective at least, um, should, should become invisible um, for the benefit of the trauma patients. We do get a lot of patients um, that have been skiing here in your country and go to the Netherlands. Why are so many things then different here from than it is in the Netherlands? Shouldn't be. So overall, we should start to establish this European trauma system. And if we do so, if we put enough energy in it, then we can connect in trauma care and optimize trauma care through the European and global networks. And that will really, really, really be a great effort. Now, this is quite a challenge. And to do so, we invite all of you to participate, young and old, um, with careers upcoming and careers almost finishing, because we need all the help that we can to look over our own borders, outside the hospital, but especially also outside the country. I thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much. It was a really stimulating talk. And uh, as Thank I know, you. you have a very, very tight schedule and a very uh, busy desk. But maybe uh, we can add a little bit to your desk. So here's a little uh, uh, recognition for your talk. I think it was excellent. We all enjoyed it. And uh, thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here and listening to this presentation.